So it's an uh, interesting thing. Sometimes when we're coming to Mass and not expecting um, certain things, we just get in the motion. I, I remember myself growing up, I didn't um, have many experiences of going to Mass, uh, maybe 10, 20 times. I don't know. It's hard to count how many Masses I went to. And when I was 19, my school teacher invited me to go to Papua New Guinea. He got me to Papua New Guinea on a mission trip for two weeks. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. And we had Mass at 7 a.m. every morning for two weeks, which is more Mass than my little heart had ever had before. <laughs> so here we are. We're awake and um, just going through the motions, kind of drudging and not expecting anything to happen. And I got to the second last day. And as I received the communion, I went back and sat down. And all of a sudden, um, it's hard to describe. This presence just came um, kind of through me. And I just... Um, I felt like the Holy Spirit was there, so present. I just remember sitting there for so long just thinking, oh my gosh, you're real, and you love me, you're real, and you love me, and I was just sitting there for, oh my gosh, he's real, he's loved me. I just kept saying it over and over. I was so, so kind of brought back by what was actually happening, because so often I'd come and, and um, yeah, just not expect anything to happen, but there he was. God was in front of me this whole time, and... The reason why I'm telling you this story is because often in our own re religious practice, um, in, our, in our, our normal walk in faith, it's, we can sometimes get in the motions. And Easter's coming. <laughs> Easter's two weeks away. Can you believe it? It's Palm Sunday next week and then it's Easter. And sometimes when we, we have these uh, feasts and important celebrations, we can approach them in two ways. We can approach them, firstly, as a, a time when we remember. We remember past events. We remember that Jesus died and rose again. It's kind of like a, we bring it to mind. And secondly, it's kind of part of our culture. It's our religious tradition. It's what we do because we're Catholic. We're Easter people. Both of these points are good. They're good points. But how does that event, how does Easter affect my life? How does it break in to my day-to-day, -day, into my, my own reality? How does it personally change me, move me forward? Can it do that? Can Easter do that for us? If so, how? The first reading gives us actually a, an answer. Now, it uses some pretty, pretty Old Testament language, but we'll give it a crack. Let's, let's break it open, hey. Saint, um, uh, sorry, Prophet Jeremiah says, See the days that are coming, it is the Lord who speaks, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, but not a covenant like the one I made with their ancestors on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Okay. So, the Lord intends to make a new covenant for us, and that was certainly won by Jesus' events at Easter. Have you heard of the words new covenant before? Come to church and you might have heard them, new covenant. Well, if you, if you speak about, um, if we hear about new covenant, like a word covenant, we, hear, we kind of call to mind like a, a legal contract, you know, between two parties. Uh, a good example is a, a wedding. We have two parties, two individuals, what, they exchange vows. I promise to, I vow publicly to do this, this and this. The other person returns, I vow publicly for the priest and for the, 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 the church, I'll do this, this, and this. It's a mutual contract. In the Bible, God makes covenant with us. God makes covenant with his people. In fact, he did that in many stages um, in the Bible and at several points in history. Now, we heard last week that Moses led the people out of Egypt and they had that ordeal with the serpents. Do you remember last week? And they had to raise up a serpent. Another thing that God did in the, in the wilderness was he, he brought Moses up the mountain he, and um, gave him the Ten Commandments. They were etched on stone. These ten rules, <laughs> how they are to live their life. And then they came down and God also gave Moses all these other uh, laws as well. Now these laws basically were... God saying to his people, if you do this, you will be blessed, you will be fruitful, you will live good lives, you will flourish. 
Just do these. And what do the people say? <laughs> the people turn back to God. And in, in 198, the people all answered as one, everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. There you go. Perfect. No worries. <laughs> what? The, oh, God gave his people the law. There's nothing wrong with the law. He gave them this, this law. And it's how to live a good life. It's how to flourish. It's how to be, a, a, you know, to be abundant and fruitful. And the people say, yeah, we'll follow all of this. <laughs> it's not a problem. This is how it works. This is how the faith works. What could go wrong? Well, as we know, St. Paul says, all have, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, the problem wasn't that the people didn't understand what was required of them as Christians, as, um, sorry, Israelites, <laughs> now Christians. The problem wasn't that at all. The problem was a hard problem. That people at times fall into evil, disobedience, violence, sin. How are we supposed to partner with God and have this, this great uh, covenant relationship if we're just going to fall short? We've got all these rules for our faith, but how can we, how can we move forward if we're going to fall short every now and then? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to be impacted by, by God and, and have perfect relationship with him and be blessed? God gives an answer to Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, I'll make a new covenant. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. God intends to write his law upon our hearts. He's going to edge, edge the right thing upon our hearts. Now, this is powerful language, and this is very important for us to, to understand. See, God is going to give us a, a, an answer to the heart problem. <laughs> to the heart problem. That's what he's looking for. And how does hearers do that? How does God fulfill this, this new covenant? How, does it, how is it accomplished? Well, that's what we celebrate at Easter. Jesus died. He took on all the weight of sin, disobedience, violence, evil. He took it on himself and he did something. He was raised to new life. He overcame the power of evil, death, darkness. This affects my reality. See, my sins were nailed to the cross. Because of what he'd done, my sins can be wiped away. What corrupts my heart can be forgiven. But not only that, not only does he forgive our sins, does he wash it away? Something else happens to our hearts by, by the new covenant. Something else is happening there. As St. Paul says in, in Romans 8, it's a great, by the way, Romans 8, if you, if you have, want to read a, a passage of scripture before Easter, highly recommend Romans 8. He says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Jesus dies and rises again for the forgiveness of sins. And then the crowning moment of his mission, as Pope Bendix says, he sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. He sent the Holy Spirit to come and to, to, to come upon us. And, and as we're baptized in the faith, and as some of you will be baptized, we can't wait, by the way. And some of you will be baptized and, and you'll, you'll be sometimes, if, uh, sometimes you'll be, uh, have water pouring upon you, sometimes you'll be, you'll be in the pool, literally in the pool, and then you'll emerge out breathing new life and the Spirit of God will make a home inside of you. It will never be taken away. The Spirit of God will come inside your heart, in, the, in, in your soul, and you'll be a temple of the Holy Spirit. That's the new covenant. See, here we have a, a tabernacle. And we reserve the blessed sacrament there. The, the true, substantial body, blood, soul, and divinity, the, the true presence of Christ is there in that, in that tabernacle. The spirit of the living God is in you. And what he's doing inside of you, it's hard to even, it's hard to imagine what you've been given. St. Paul calls it the boundless riches in Christ. Inside of us, we have the Holy Spirit. And whether we realize it or not, the Spirit is at work. He's speaking to us, sometimes in words that, that can't even, um, our minds can't even understand, but the Spirit of the heart understands. He leads us. 
He draws us deeper into relationship with, with God. He speaks to us. He unlocks us for us a new identity as sons and daughters of God. It, the, Romans 8 goes on and says, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the very spirit bearing witness. What Paul, St. Paul's saying is inside of us is the Holy Spirit and he moves our heart towards understanding our true identity. And our true identity is that we're sons and daughters of God. The Bible uses the word adoption because as an adopted child, when you, when you become adopted, um, you get the full inheritance of that family. We get the full inheritance of what God has for us. God has for us in the spirit the boundless riches in Christ. <sighs> it's hard to summarize the gospel message in five minutes, but here we are. We did our best. <laughs> so this is, the, this is the message. This is why we're an Easter people. This is, this is why we look forward with hope to what God does. And in our own lives, we often, here and now, we fall short. We often go through difficult times. But do we know that the, that the, the, the Spirit of God is inside of us? Do we know that the, the resurrection power is available to us? See, often when we fall short, we can kind of go in on ourselves. We can come back to, the, come back to, the, to ourselves. We kind of bring things in. Or when we go through hard seasons, we, we try and work out how we can, we can overcome our trials, how we can overcome our, our difficulties by our strength, by our capabilities, by our resources. You have boundless riches in Christ inside of you. The spirit of a living God is inside of you. Turn to him. You are his beloved child. You are a son and, or daughter of God. And the, the Spirit bears witness to that. He, he, he shows you that in, inside of your heart, that he'll help you to pray. He'll help you to become close to him. He'll help you to, to lead you and to guide you and to change your heart if, if, you, if you allow him, if you partner with him and work with him. So that's what we ask, Lord, that as we enter into this Easter season, that what happened doesn't just become a, a, just only a remembering or a religious observance, um, which are good, of course, but what happens there is it affects my life. It fills me with hope. It, looks, it, it pushes me forward and say, yes, I want the Holy Spirit to make himself more at home inside of me. I want to work with God in my life. I open up to the power of this resurrection for all that he won for me the boundless riches in Christ. Amen.